now for something special. The unit is self-contained with its own saddler, farrier, wheelwright, and so on. It's a rigorous training dished down who know all there is to know about horses, and it brings results. We take you behind the scenes now to show just some of the interesting aspects of this training. Welcome to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein, the best podcast to create sounder horses from the ground up. Mike Stein is a registered journeyman farrier with an APF1 accreditation. On this week's episode, first aid for laminitis and looking at a hoof x-rays and lessons we have learned from a, a gentleman of ours uh, by the name of Jack Miller. And also your questions will be answered as well on this week's podcast. And over to my far right hand side is Mike Stein. How are you? I'm doing good, Travis. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Um, so my wife, for those of you out there listening, uh, we broadcast just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, a beautiful little town we like to call Marshville. My wife has a horse. Uh, we have several horses here on the property, and our main horse is off at a, what I call like a daycare. Uh, it does a lot of, uh, it's got a covered arena. Um, we have a lot of rain and snow this time of year, and our arena kind of gets flooded at some time, so we, we're boarding the horse over to, at another facility. Uh, it, it's now starting to get into spring, so at the end of March, we're going to bring that horse home. Now, Mike, you're familiar where it's located at now. Yes. And you've been shooing the horse and doing all the stuff that, that needs to be taken care of on that side over on that development. Now, it's starting to, it's going to be moving back to our property. Is there anything that we need to adjust as far as the feet or any kind of, um, any adjustments at all? For, oh, the, yeah, for the conditions that we have here on our property. Well, the one thing I am going to throw at you, and this goes back at the last few weeks we were talking about. Grass is coming in. She's going to see more grazing here. So we need to pull back on the groceries a little bit, I would think, and, and monitor her weight. And as far as feet goes, right now I'm getting a number of calls from vet clinics to have to set up with them to work on horses that are going into Lamin laminitic type problems so that is flaring up in our part of the country like right now and we want to avoid that outside of that i uh, keep on your normal routine but i would uh i would consider dropping back on the groceries a bit so we have we have the hay we have three different pastures and we have that timothy timothy orchard that's compressed so my wife has not uh fed any of the horses since the grass has been coming in we haven't done any of the because we have a couple uh, lawn ornaments here on our property um, so we've been backing off the, the Timothy Hay from them as well. Um, how long? Be I'm sorry. You, you also need to transition them on her onto the grass because I don't know what the grazing looks like over where she's been. I'm, I'm suspecting not, not near as much as you've got here. So you need to slowly wean them onto it. Don't just throw out all there at one time. So we have three pastures. The center pasture, which uh, goes into the paddocks, is kind of like covered with trees. It's kind of like the, the relaxing uh, pasture. There's not a whole lot of grass in there, not as lush as the front two pastures. Right. They get full sunlight all day long. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to probably move her out to the front pasture till about noon. You know, from 8 o'clock to about noon, a good four hours you would think would be good for that? i tell you the truth. Up front, I think I'd start with about an hour, hour and a half. Oh, that little. And then kind of slowly go from there. I've, I've just had to deal with too many horses that have had some laminitis, you know, laminar insults. And we just don't we just don't want to cross that line. It's much better be very cautious than to deal with problems. Yeah, see, I was just thinking that normally you just let them out there till lunchtime and then bring them back into the normal paddocks and, and the pasture that doesn't have a whole lot of grass and then they're done for the day as far as uh well that would probably be that would probably be a plenty but i don't like to say there again i don't know that she's seen any fresh grass over there and or how much now if they have have pastures that are very comparable to yours the grasses are going to be very similar and it's not as big a deal but i don't I, i've not looked at where she's living well amy will be out there tomorrow and i'll tell her to make a note because uh she's going out there with a line trainer uh, is that what it's called, where they do the loop around the, the horses, no rider on, and it's got the, the, the lead rope that wraps around? I don't know if I'm... <laughs> sure, we can call it a line trainer. <laughs> okay, we'll call it a line trainer. So she'll be out there tomorrow uh, hanging out with that person. All right, guys, stick around. we got a big show to get into and lots to discuss. You're listening to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. It's not you. It's me, Mike. <laughs> okay, I, I understand. I understand. <laughs> My feelings are hurt, right, but I understand. I'm sure they are. <laughs> Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. 
If you'd like to get a question into us, the way you do that is go over to equinedynamics.com. At the top of the page says contacts. Fill out that little form there uh, and put in the subject line podcast uh, and ask us any question and we'll answer them on the very next show. And uh, we'll send you out some free stickers or for all those that, that put in their, uh, their request, their questions. And make sure you put a return address so we can get that out to you. And over to my far right-hand side is Mike Stein. How are you? I'm doing good. And don't forget, for every podcast we do, we also have a matching video as well. And Mike slowly has been doing little test runs, little 10-minute videos, little 15-minute videos on uh, things on his YouTube page. And that's Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein over on YouTube. Make sure you check him out as well. What was the one that you were trying the other day? Some kind of bio? What were you doing? Well, I was, I've got some s specimens, and we were doing a, leg, a lower leg anatomy and uh, have not posted one that we were happy with yet. So keep an eye out for that. And, and it's, it's a little different talking to a camera. <laughs> it is. It, it's not as fun as talking to me directly. Oh, no. Not near. Now, uh, we're going to talk about first aid for laminitis. Well, first aid for laminitis. You know, guys, this is something that coming in on horses when they're way behind the eight ball and you want to minimize damage up front if you suspect laminitis one of the first things you do is don't say oh my god my horse is not laminitic there's no way my horse is laminitic i want to wait and see if this thing gets bad let's go ahead and first call your vet if you suspect suspect that's what's going on um check you know, learn how to check pulse and heat and all that from your vet, from your farrier, people that are accustomed to doing it. They'll gladly show you when they're doing their regular routine visits in your barn. And, uh, you know, from the, the, you know, from the front end of it, you're trying to manage inflammation, hot feet. And, uh, you know, ice and feet, that's, that is one deal. Uh, cooling them down, trying to take inflammation down. If you are low dip, load up your part of the problem with soaking feet is the feet get saturated they get soaking wet if you're going to come back and glue adhesives or anything on that creates a problem so you want to really load that water down with your epsom salt or whatever you're you're doing because that tends to keep the hoof itself drier then also this foam board you can get foam board at lowe's you know the the yeah like when you have like science uh things for like elementary school foam foam course though Right. The, little, the the white foam board crushes and comes apart. If you get like the blue insulation board or the pink insulation board, okay, yeah. that does better. And I'll tell you something else that I've used in a quick pinch is there's like a roll of this. It's got like a got a lot of air in it. A little, what I got was blue. I'm sure it comes in other colors. Mm -hmm. But it comes on a roll, and you can ball that up in a ball and duct tape it on the bottom of the foot and give them some cushion, and they'll just kind of squish into it, and they'll go toe down. It looks like there there are some kits sold with some two inch blocks of foam board that are kind of in foot molds, and you know you can go that way if you want. You can do anything you want. Half of a half of a kid's rubber foam ball taped under the back of the foot. That, I've seen that done. Rolls the galls, uh, but in, something to give them a little bit of support. If you know as they toe down, if as you add pieces on. You can just tape right to the bottom of it, add another layer, add another layer, add another layer. An inch or half inch goes away real quick. If you can find some of that two-inch board, that is that will uh, take a little while longer to compress down. And when it does, you can stick another piece right on the bottom of it. You can do it with inch-thick foam board. You just got to keep adding, adding more pieces quicker. You would, you would think with the horse community and the way people are and the way they feel about their horses and how much, you know, money is spent in the whole equine industry that they would have something created for this than just going to Lowe's and buying a, a sheet of insul well, they, insulation and just slap it on your horse. Well, they do. Oh, they okay. They do. You know, they have the soft ride boots have has an insert built for laminitis, but you don't always have that on hand. Mm -hmm. And if you decide to go that route, you can order them, but they're not cheap. How, what ballpark? How much do you think they go for? I think they're a couple hundred plus. And this is for something that you're, if you have laminitis on your horse, is it an investment? Like you would always need these things around or is it, it something? It would be, you know, if, if you've had a horse that has been around with laminitis, it would be smart to have something on, on hand. I use on the first aid run, I use a lot of the red and ultimates. And that's something that has done well for me. Uh, if you got somebody that's going in that direction, you need some training. And uh, that 
that is kind of my go-to if I think something's going to get ugly. There's clogs. There's a number of other deals out there you can cast onto, tape onto. But for the owner, if you can wrap that foot and just get something under them to to get them off the ground, give them a little protection, let it start molding to the bottom of the foot, start providing some support. And you know, years ago, you take a horse out in time in the middle of a sandy creek and let the water wash through, and in the sand, they would end up towing down the sand, and the sand molds up into the bottom of the foot right, right nice. Hmm. Or sometimes b- bedding in the stall in deep sand. That That's another thing. But if you, you know, to put six inches of sand in a stall, if you're buying individual little sandbags, that's a bunch of little individual sandbags. <laughs> and it ends up being a, a cat box. <laughs> yeah, a great big box. kitty litter box, yes. <laughs> but they can, you know, they can manage pretty well. And if you watch them, they will, they will work their foot into it and they will tend to toe down, which, you know, they, when, they, when they start towing down, that's taking pressure off of that deep flexor tendon, which comes around, wraps around the navicular bone and attaches up under the cough bone. And that's the driving force that's trying to pull against the lamina. And if you take some of that pressure off the lamina, the lamina can settle down a little easier. And we want to minimize damage to that lamina up quick and fast. To me, I would I would think that a horse would, would kind of kick it off because it felt odd to the horse. You know, like if you ever put... It's not that everyone does this, but I might put socks on a, on a, on a dog, you know, they don't know what to do with their thing. So I'm thinking that this foam core that you're going to stick on the bottom of their feet, they're just going to like, are they going to, I'm not going to say that some of them won't, (laughs) but you can secure it pretty good and they'll get used to it and they'll find it. They can find it a little more comfortable than where where they have been. I don't mind a horse that's into laminitis laying down, getting off their feet a little bit sometimes. Oh, really? No, if if they if they stretch out on the ground every now and then, get comfortable, get some get some rest. They're not putting mechanical pressure on their feet. Hmm. Well, very good. All right, guys. When we come back, we're going to uh, talk about looking at hoof X-rays and what to look out for. Stick around. You're listening to uh, Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. Yeah, I would think that they would go get off my foot. Mm. <laughs> you know. Well, some of them do, but you can. Uh... You get use I use, I plan on using about a roll of tape per foot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's not coming off whether they want it not, or not. Not real easy. Not real All easy. Right. Ready? Yes, sir. Oh, let me switch screens here. Back to this. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. Make sure you follow him on all those social networks. Uh, go over to Facebook, search for Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He's also available on YouTube as well. And we'd like to answer any of those questions you might have for us. And the way you get a uh, hold of Mike is to go to equinedynamics.com. At the top of the page, click on contacts and fill out the little form there and send them any of your questions that you may have. We'll answer them on the very next podcast and we'll send you out some free stickers and stuff we got in our little prize bin over there. And uh, over to my far right hand side is Mike Stein. Good morning, Travis. How are you? I'm doing good. You passed the house to, uh, on the way here. What happened? You, did you blank forget where, where the studio was? I was just taking the scenic route. <laughs> Now, we're going to talk about looking at hoof x-rays. What should we be looking for uh, when we get them, and when should the x-rays actually start? It's good to have some baseline x-rays up front before you get in any trouble. To you, Even if you're not dealing with laminitis, just dealing with a horse. There are cha- always changes through the life cycle of a horse. And when you start having some issues, mechanical issues or whatever, we take x-rays. But we don't know exactly know where we were before. So, you know, when I work for Dr. Mansman, he suggested a, a set of lateral x-rays once a year as a, as a maintenance deal. You rarely see that done. But, you know, when I'm looking at an x-ray, I'm looking at the bone column alignment because your long pasture and short pasture and your coffin bone should run in a line. You shouldn't have a break in the joint alignment. It should be a good, nice, clean line all the way down. The other, th- other deal is if you make a level line with the ground talk, starting at the top of the hoof capsule and you look where that extensor process, the, uh, right on the front edge at the top of the coffin bone itself, you look at where that is and you can measure your depth. And is that is that at a good place or is that sitting too far down, which would... That's how you have we had had any sinking. 
You can have horses that have had some sinking that have had absolutely no rotation. You can also have coffin bones that have broken backwards. If you, When you come down below the extension process, measure straight out off the front of your cough bone to the outside of the wall and, and down the, towards the bottom of the cough bone around the tip, do the, do the same thing. And look at that thickness. Is that a similar thickness? Now, if somebody has been real hard with the rasp, you can have a distortion, and we can we can shape that back. So that's not always a true reading. And there is a paste that you can put on the hoof capsule that will follow every wrinkle in it and look at the x-rays. And you can see exactly where, where that is because some of that front edge gets burnt out depending on the power you're shooting because that you, you got thickness as you go around to that rounded front, you get a really narrow point. So some of that will be burnt out. So it's not completely true reading. If you get a good x-rays, you have a lucid zone between the coffin bone and the hoof wall. And how thick is your lucid zone? And is does it conform consistently with the wall or you know if you have a loose loose a lucid zone that is stretched out at the bottom but your your wall is straight you know you know somebody's been on that with a rasp hard and you've had some distortion then under the tip of the coffin bone to the ground plane back on the coffin bone to the ground plane look at your thickness of sole you can also use your paste on the sole so you can see how much cup you've got because if you're measuring all the way to the ground, that's not always a true rate of actual sole thickness. We want to know how much cups there, how much is actual actual sole thickness. And those, that's kind of where, where I start. And if you, you know, if you can give those numbers over the phone to somebody else and you can check the angle of the coffin bone and your bone column alignment, if it's broken in any direction, the angulation, I can sit there on a piece of paper not looking at the x-ray and pretty well draw out an accurate picture of what your x-ray looks like. So my question is, when you have a vet take a, the x-rays, and does he hand it over to you, or is the, is the vet actually giving you all this information? I guess the question is, can a vet be a farrier, but a farrier can't be a vet, you know, as far as reading those x-rays? Well, I mean, you know, I've looked at a lot of x-rays. On their units, they can run all the lines. They can make the measurements. If you're shooting an x-ray, and I had a little situation here a few years ago on a horse that was in the laminitis, and, you know, I got I got a feedback from the vet. Oh, she looks like she's got plenty of sole thickness, but you looked at that sole thickness, and then you looked at the thickness of that dorsal wall, and it's like, whoa, because if, you, if the numbers were actually right on the sole thickness, that dorsal wall measurement was way out of range as far as being wider than normal, which that, okay, we got a bomb getting ready to go off. Don't, didn't have any rotation. So when it got it actually measured, we didn't have but about eight millimeters of sole, sole depth under the horse at that time, which that whole changed the picture. The sole was too thin, but our distortion, our distortion on the wall, we were in a better range. It wasn't perfect. We did have some movement where, you know, if you get a lot of inflammation, it put it can it kind of pushes the coffin bone straight back from the you know from the hoof wall, and if that, that, that if that area is too big, you've got really stressed lamina, or the horse has been through something several times before because that's one one part that we tend to not tends not to change. You can trim and derotate a coffin bone, and we can pro provide support and over time get a foot in norm closer to normal ranges but you can go back and look at that and say is this horse had insults to the lamina or not now a lot of times when i'm looking at those lateral x-rays anymore i'm doing a lot more a lot more performance issues working with that than i am working with uh, laminitic horses these days but you still take notice because everything's part of the puzzle and there, there are programs they can they can lay out every measurement right there on the X-ray and send it to you. And I get you know I get X-rays with the digitals. Um, that's part of why I had to go to a high tech phone because <laughs> I I really would like to go back to smoke signals. But you know they can they can they can text you got X-rays to me. You got to change with the times, Mike. Well, it's hard. <laughs> it is hard. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk about a gentleman that Mike grew up with and knew for a very long time by the name of Jack Miller and all the lessons that he's taught Mike throughout the years. Stick around. You're listening to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. Is that fair to say grew up with, I guess? Well, 
Not completely, but we'll work on that. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know. They don't know. Mm-mm. They don't know where you grew up. No. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. Make sure you follow him on YouTube and follow him on Facebook, and you can get your questions in through the Facebook feed as well. And Mike has been posting some uh, past videos you had the other day uh, that you've done years ago. And if you want to see those, just search for Equine Dynamics um, with Mike Stein. And what was the video that you posted the other day that was like a two-year-old video? Uh, you're filling in a hole or something well, with somebody. That video, we're probing some you in this part of the country if you get a crack a lot of times you'll get a get a place tunneled out behind it mm-hmm. where you end up with fungus in there and cleaned out the crack and i was putting something up the crack to take care of killing the fungus so that the crack can grow out so go out there and uh make sure you like them on facebook and you can get your questions in as well we got a question also that we're going to answer in the next segment here but right now we're going to talk about a gentleman that that mike knew for a while growing up um maybe just an acquaintance of his as well how would you describe jack miller as far as your relationship with him and well, <laughs> what you learn from him? Jack was a farrier. Jack at the time was living in West Texas and I'd met him through some, some of the stuff with you know, the fairies associations early on and watched him and listened to his lectures and all that. Jack worked on a lot of big end jumpers and some pretty major hunter horses. And he was flying all over the country. Well, everywhere he went, he had somebody he worked with. Because getting off an airplane, he had a bag of stuff. And, you know, for him to have a full shoeing rig, he had somebody to work with. So, you know, I would pick Jack up at the airport or meet Jack somewhere when he came into the Carolinas. And we would go work on horses. And he also needed somebody, if they pulled shoes or whatever, to be able to replace it and all that. But Jack was... a uh, Jack was Jack, if you knew him. Jack was a <laughs> ornery old rascal. Was he a salty dog? He was a salty dog. That's a that's a good way of putting it. But he was he was sharp and he looked. And you know, one thing he told me is he said, you know, as a fairy, there's not but a couple of things we can really do. We can eliminate eliminate leverage, and we can provide support. He says it's just learning where to eliminate leverage and provide the support. And he had a good eye for looking at a horse. And you have to learn to treat each limb as an individual and work around what that limb is doing. And he was looking at, you know, he, he watched a lot of horses go. And if they had performance issues, Jack would make an adjustment, might be an adjustment in a trim or something like that. And we would, uh, you get the horse going better. And also, that's where I learned about playing with weight placement. Because there were times where he would use a, just a touch of weight at some point in the shoe to help get normalized movement pattern. If we had a, a strange movement pattern to help the horse move well, in a better in a better direction. Like a lead weight? Like you put on your car rim to, to balance the tire out? That type of lead weight? Or, or a weight, I guess? Is that what you're... Th- what he's done? Shh. Nobody's supposed to hear that. <laughs> it was no more than a squeeze. If you think about the size of a horse. Yes. You Big. know, those little squeeze on fishing weights. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little, little pinching that goes on the line. Yeah, they're like a little teardrop or whatever. Right. Some of them are, yeah. Right. Knock a place in the back of the shoe and squash one in it. Oh, really? And and that sometimes that was all it took to clean up a movement pattern. Huh. And, you know, if you, if you got a, a leg that is flipping around an odd place, you pick up that joint and you feel the way it moves and in your hand, it will move in a pretty normal position, but something is offset the foot and creating an odd swing. Or the paddle, like I was talking about last exactly. week. Exactly. Exactly. And you could get that me- leg moving true with the joint alignment with very little and so I have in rare occasions used that. I don't very often because, you know, the biggest thing was nailing down how you're trimming the foot. And that was another thing with Jack. You know, he said, you're just talking about flares. Do you have problems with flares? Yep. You dress them down? Yep. Do they come back? Yep. You're not getting rid of the flares. It's still there. <laughs> like, what do you mean, Jack? He said, you can still see the flare. You can dress that thing to a straight line. But if you start paying attention to the coronary band, start paying attention to what the foot's doing, 
you got to take care of that. He said, you can get rid of a flare without dressing the flare down. I was like, what do you mean? Okay, what, what's happening on the ground surface of the, where you have the flare? Well, it's pulling away. We'll break that contact. Also, another thing you need to do is there's always a push, there's always a pull. Where's the push coming from? Take care of the push. And you'll feel that in hard areas in the, in the, cor- in the coronary band. A lot of times it will be something diagonally in the foot. Not always. Sometimes it will be on the same side. But you're normalizing the pressure, and you, you got pressure pushing up. you got pressure pulling out, and you've got to address both of them. And that's one thing I did learn from Jack. He, and he did call it, Slayer, you got to take care of your bananas. <laughs> what does he mean by that? Well, you know, the, the flare shaped like a banana point in the hoof. Okay. You got to get you got to get rid of the bananas and get the foot in the center of the leg. Is that a technical term? Like, if I go into the vet and go, "Oh, doc, guess what? I got to get rid of the bananas on my horse." Would the vet look at me cross eyed and go, "Get out of here"? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and uh, because see, at that point they would know you were bananas, <laughs> right? But that nurse, Jack, nurse, take them away, that please. Was a big thing with Jack, you got to take care of those bananas because the foot's bananaing. And but when you say that and, and you tell me what it actually means, I can picture that. So that's a, an excellent description of what it is. Well, it is. It is. It is. And if if you can't see it, feel it and draw it. And that was another thing. Like some of the top fairies I've worked with made me draw feet, made me measure, made me this. Jack's thing, can you see what's going on right there? Okay, put your hand on it. Do you now draw across where you feel that change in the foot. Now step back and look at it. Do you see it now? And it's train your eyes to grab what's going on. Because part of what we're look you'll find out by doing that is is what I'm seeing an illusion or is it what's actually there? Because sometimes you will see something looks one way and you start feeling it and drawing out and you step back. It's like that's not what's going on there at all. And that was a big thing in short, like when I look at feet, you got to get past the illusion. You, you know, the, those old pictures that you would look at and it's kind of a blur of dots and all that. And if you could change your focus, oh, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a picture in there. Yeah, there's like a schooner in the, in the middle of in the a schooner. <laughs> yeah, you got to be able to see the schooner. <laughs> and by picking up and filling and keeping your sharp in your box and drawing, you can start seeing that schooner. You get where you can start walking up to it. Boom, boom, boom. There's a schooner. Yeah. And that's one place where Jack really helped me out. And because, okay, is that way the horse really is, or is that an illusion? And where's Jack now? Jack, uh, we lost him a few years ago. Jack was Jack did make it to 70. Um, he had a heart attack in his truck. The uh. last time I spoke to Jack was a couple of months before he had the heart attack because I'm kicking stuff over. Oh, is that there. what you're doing? <laughs> and I asked Jack, I said, when are you going to retire? He said, I've chased these guys up and down the road my whole life. He says, I'm going to keep on doing it to the bitter end. He says, I'm not ever retiring. And, and he ended up dying in his truck. He was in his shoe and truck. He had a heart attack and he's off the side of the road. And uh, a few days later, he was gone. But he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He was going to keep out there, out there chasing them up and down the road. And he, that, that is where I got my, my real experience with dealing with big jumpers. And I do a few. There's not that many in the area. And that's part of why Jack chat traveled all over the country. But uh, he did teach me a lot about building support, why to build support, how to see what was going on with the horse, like where we need to build support. And also, do we need to, you're either supporting or reducing leverage. If you set a shoe out wide on one side, you're supporting. If you narrow it up, you're really re- reducing leverage in that direction. Awesome. All right, guys, when we come back, uh, we'll take a couple of your questions from emails that we've received and also wrap up on what we learned today. Stick around. You're listening to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. That's funny. Bananaing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's like Jack. He's a take, got, got to take care of those bananas. You keep shooting a horse like that, you got to start bringing some whipped cream with you to put on that foot because that banana's still there. Uh, the, the question, uh, was this from an actual... Uh, listener, or is this just something that, in general, what, what are some of the reasons why horses pull a shoe? Is, uh, that pro- was a question that was sent in. I'm <clears throat> not sure who sent it in. Uh, my wife picked that up and told me about it. I said, uh-huh, and send it to you. Okay. 
So that's how we got to where we are. All right. Because I was going, I was going to make up a name and a location just to. But if it's actual someone that put that sent it in, I won't make up a name. I do not know the name. I was told the name, and there again, I'm a guy. I said, uh huh. All right. Well, we'll work that in too. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. Make sure you get your questions into him. And the way you do that is go to equinedynamics.com. At the top of the page, it says contacts. Fill out the little form there and email Mike. And in the subject line, just put podcast so he can decipher between all his other emails and stuff that he gets. And please put your name. Please put a return address, and we'll send you out some uh, some free swag here from the station. And uh, over to my far right side is Mike Stein. How are you? Doing good, Travis. So uh, we have a question from uh, one of our listeners. Now, who... You don't know who the the question is. You know it at well, home. I was I was told, but there again, I'm a guy, right? <laughs> right. So the question that was sent from one of our listeners, and we'll find out who you are. Mike, Mike will have to go back to the email uh, and see what your name is and everything. So we apologize that we don't have it here. We'll give you credit. Um, the question that we received was: What are some reasons horses pull shoes? What are some reasons horses pull shoes? Now, one of the first things that I did as an early on as a fairy is shorten up the shoe. Wasn't a good answer because that created other problems with the back of the foot. Timing. If a horse is at a time between the front and back end, they will are scrambling, they will get all over themselves. My my wife puts bells on the shoes when she puts them. I'm, I'm not sure if they Bell go. Boots, yeah. yeah. What do those do and when do you put them on? I don't know if she puts them on when she trailers the horse or if she just puts them out in the pasture or anything like that. When do the bells uh, take place? Well, they... Uh, they help protect the front shoe because we need to put enough support to hold the bone column up. And that's a target. And if you start shortening them on that, you down the road will create other problems. I'd rather, you know, it's like there again, going back to Jack, you know, if he's like put the support where it needs to be. And he said, you can put a shoe back on, we can rebuild a foot. But if we blow a tendon, because when that foot hits the ground, it's not supported and it collapses hard and throws a lot of extra load on a tendon or ligament or something like that, hmm, we can't just fix that. We can put a shoe back on. So that was his outlook on it. And if you've got horses that are getting all over themselves, one of the old things he says, speed up the front end and slow down the back end. Well, if you've got a horse going on a 100-mile trip and the front end's going faster than the back end how much longer is the horse by the time it gets there that was uh, something that a, a another old dave millwater pointed out that was one of his entertaining outlooks on it and you know you can't stretch a horse so the other end of it is if a horse is running inverted and they're not getting the body moving the shoulders are locked they're not getting it out of the way and the back end's trying to come through and gets all over the front end so what can we do as a farrier? Well, we can start looking at our breakover. Can we get the foot rolling a little cleaner so it at least breaks up off the ground instead of sitting flat on the ground when the back foot collides with it? And that's where your bell boots can come in. And dealing with horses that are on cross country, if they get in a scramble at some point, sometimes they'll 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 they'll, they'll take a shoe. And but getting that timing right, which getting the timing right involves the back being up. And I had a, someone I spoke to the other day, uh, not, not one of my clients, but they had someone watch them ride, and the instructor that watched them ride said the reason you're pulling shoes is the, partly the way you're riding a horse. And there's, you know, they weren't getting the horse to lift. And there's too many horses out there that have back problems. Kissing spine, if the back's down, it puts, shows the spines together. If the back's up, it gives them a chance to separate. But if they are dropped in the middle, the way the pelvis should be working, the way the shoulders should be working, it's not there. And horse is still going forward, so they got to get there the best way they can, which sometimes is getting all over themselves. So, you know, I want the hind end to come through up under the horse that can lift the horse. To be able to lift the horse, the back has to be able to go up. And if you can get the back to go up, it starts getting the horse off the shoulders, so then the shoulders can get moving and get that front end out of the way. My, my wife always says, <clears throat> excuse me, my wife always says um, she's worried about, like I said, we have the three pastures and the center pasture is basically just dirt and, and shady trees and stuff. So when we get a good rain, there's nothing really to hold the water 
there, so it turns into mud. And she always says, when the horse starts running around in that in that little pasture, she's like, oh, my God, she's going to throw a shoe. Slow down. Stop. Well, slow if they down. Get, if yeah. they get into deep mud, there is a certain amount of a vacuum when the, they shove the foot down into the mud. And as far as what your horse does out in the field, uh, they do what they do. And uh, there is another farrier that had – that. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name actually in North Carolina. One of his things is you can shoe a horse for work and you can shoe a horse for turnout, but you can't shoe a horse for both. Mm -hmm. So they're, if they get out acting silly and cutting up and clowning and bucking and whatever else they decide to do, cause they feel frisky that day. Spring weather's here. Woohoo. <laughs> well, they're going to do things All right. and they're going to lose a shoe every now and then. And you know, if you got a muddy pasture and they're slipping and sliding and scrambling, They'll take off some more shoes, and they, you'll also, in a deep mud hole, find a shoe sucked off in it. And, you know, you just need to put a great big tent over your property so you don't run into that. <laughs> well, that's what I was hoping with the big shade trees. All right, Mike, so what did we learn today? First aid for laminitis. Move quickly. Move front. Call your vet. Start dealing with inflammation. Uh, start providing protection, protection to the foot. There are things you can do quickly without getting overly bankrupted to do it and you're much better move on the front end and minimize damage than wait until it's a mess and trying to deal with damage later uh, looking at hoof x-rays understand what's really there that's another video that needs to be made but understand what's there understand the thought process understand what it means and they can give you accurate measurements usually they'll do it in in, in millimeters and but they can give you actual accurate numbers off of the x-ray so you know what the real measurements are if you just look at it sometimes and you say oh that looks good when you start running the, num the numbers sometimes you'll find that maybe you're not and lessons that you've learned from jack miller well jack was jack <laughs> if anybody knew jack they'd know exactly what i'm talking about uh he was a uh, he was a piece of work but you know he had a good eye for a horse and he understood a lot of how to put a horse together. Watch your bananas. Watch your bananas. <laughs> Don't deal with bananas. Go get go. If you want to deal with bananas, go get you some uh, some whipped cream and <laughs> cherries to put on it. All right, guys. Uh, make sure you follow Mike Stein over at YouTube. That's Equine Dynamics uh, with Mike Stein over at YouTube. Make sure you like him on Facebook. Get your questions in. You can do that through there as well. And he posts some old videos that he he's taken many years ago and even current ones that he's doing now. He'll post those on Facebook as well. And also get your questions in. Go to equinedynamics.com. Put in a podcast in the subject line and we'll answer your question on the very next episode. On behalf yeah. of Mike Stein over my far right hand sign. Have a good day. It'd be Mike Stein at equinedynamics.com. And some of the, there are some that you would, if you would go to the Facebook page, my business Facebook page, you'll find some of them on there because I have not posted them all on YouTube. Yet. Right. All right, guys, we'll let you get back to enjoying the rest of your day. And that'll do us. Thanks. See you next week. All of the doggies are in the corral. All of your work is done. Just close your eyes and dream, little pal. Dream of someone. Hi, Lucky. Good night, Ned. Hi, Dusty. Good night, Ned. Good night, Ned.